Okay. All right, well, we're going to continue talking about labral tears. So we'll talk about anterior, posterior, inferior, superior, multiple, and complications of uh, uh, labral tears. So we start with anterior injuries. Uh, there's a bank heart tears. You can have a soft tissue bank heart, which is basically a tear of and uh, showing the mechanism of this, of uh, the labrum. Or you can have bony bank cards, which we'll talk in great deal about. Perthes lesions, Alps lesions, and GLAD lesions anteriorly there. So anterior instability, the mechanism of injury, I'll show. Uh, you typically will get a hill sac impaction fracture, the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head. It's the same location where you get traction cystic changes at the infraspinatus insertion and the same place where you get chronic repetitive traction injuries from internal impingement. So that you have to differentiate the three of those from each other. And we'll talk about Bancart lesions, and anterior labor, and then uh, talk about how to repair it. So the pathophysiology, kind of first uh, described by Flowers in 1861, where the humeral head dislocates anteriorly, then the muscles contract and bang it back against the anterior inferior part of the glenoid. This produced the hill sacs injury here, which is described radiologically in 1940. Uh, that's the compression, that's a fracture. When the patient relocates, and most of the time they get spontaneous relocation, sometimes it's assisted by the orthopedic surgeons or other healthcare workers, you're left with the anterior labral tear and the hill sacs injury. The hill sacs injury typically have this V-shaped configuration that helps us differentiate it from the other two. Okay, so uh, let's see. Tayson, what do you think of this case? Normal or abnormal? Definitely abnormal. So it looks like we have a anterior inferior uh, dislocation of the... Okay. So there you can see that mechanism of injury, the anterior dislocation of the humeral head, the muscle bang it back against the anterior inferior glenoid, and there you can see the glenoid in, uh, producing the hill sac uh, injury here uh, on the plane. Uh, that's what looks uh, like. it looks like. It usually occurs with the outstretched arm. Uh, the patient falls, supports it themselves. With outstretched arm and the shoulder, that's okay. Good. And then here we can see that same thing uh, on CT. The anterior dislocation, the glenoid banging against the uh, the posterior superior humeral head, producing the classic uh, hill sax lesion. And then you can also fracture the glenoid here, which is the classic bony bank heart that we'll be talking about. Here's the same thing on an MR examination. So uh, there you can see the humerus has not been uh, relocated. It's dislocated and impacting against the, the glenoid. Here we can see the humeral head is dislocated. It's not in the plane of the, of the glenoid uh, due to anterior dislocation. Okay. And when this occurs, you also need to look for other bone fragments, which uh, may be in the area. And on plain films, again, here's the anterior dislocation, the hill sacs lesion. And then here we can see on the Y view, the anteriorly dislocated humeral head and uh, uh, outside the glenoid fossa. And then typically it would take x-rays post-reduction, but here we don't see it. We see that it's not actually reduced. Um, traumatic events, uh, which you're showing, um, uh, with with significant uh, fall, uh, usually do not relocate uh, on their own. Um, chronic um, uh, recurrent dislocations, you can just. Uh, Put, put them back, uh, the patient puts them back in place. But uh, acute situations where there's a significant trauma, uh, they don't go back in place. So you have to reduce them. Thank you, John. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so here at MR, looks like, again, we have a dislocation. Um, something's missing here. Right. And something's missing here. Yes. Where are the axial images on the slope field scanner? Right. That's an anterior dislocation. The hill sex lesion. Come on. Um, so this is a... These are axial images. We see that the humeral head is in the plane of the uh, glenoid, um, but there's a hill sex uh, lesion and surrounding edema. So this is possibly post reduction. Okay. So, uh, yeah, hill sex lesions can occur in a number of locations, but the classic one is posteriorly superiorly here. In the acute phase, now you can often you can often get chronic hill sex lesions, and then when they re-dislocate, you can get an acute on top of chronic. This happened to be an acute first-time dislocation. We can see the bone marrow edema associated with the impacted fracture here, typical V-shaped. This is PD fat sat. This is the old gradient echo sequences, which we used to use a couple of decades ago. And in the coronal plane, we can see the evidence of an acute hill sex with uh, poorly marginated bone edema consistent with acute uh, bone marrow edema? Most cases that, that the radiologists are going to look at uh, have been reduced by the time the patient gets to you. Right. Um, some cannot be reduced, uh, and that's when you, uh, you you get your MRIs. Okay. Okay, so uh, Robert, uh, this is from uh, Brazil, uh, airplane crash. Uh, so it looks like there's anterior dislocation of the humerus relative to the glenoid. Right. I have a little fragment there. Okay. Okay, they tried relocating, and this is what it looked like. Uh, so it looks like it's in better position, but it still doesn't look like it's properly aligning with the glenoid. So is John... John... Why not? Uh, that's a good question. I mean... There must be. Well, I only ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd want to see an MRI, get some better detail. There you go. Well, of course you would. <laughs> uh, well, something is not allowing that head to reduce. Now, I'm not going to tell you about any more. I'm just going <laughs> to. Uh, all right. Looking at that axial, it does look like there's a hypo intense structure within that joint, which I think would be probably the biceps tendon. I'm, I'm a good guess. Yeah. yeah. So this was a dislocated biceps, which was inhibiting re uh, relocation. So as as John said, the time to get an MR scan is when uh, you don't have an easy relocation. Good. All right, 30 year old male pain and clicking on abduction to 90 after surgical reconstruction for dislocation. Okay. These cases uh, that are not reduced um, on x ray usually wind up in surgery that, that evening. Um, we don't wait on those. Um, because of possibility of uh, vascular injury or whatever. Right. So uh, it, it, these are uh, quite frequently opened up and reduced or uh, arthroscopically uh, examined and reduced. Thanks, John. All right. Um... Don't. Are we looking at an axial on the left? Um, or is this a, yeah, it's an axial. Yeah, remember, the, the clicking is at an abduction to 90 degrees. Uh, so this is really coronal with respect to the glenoid because the arm is up above the head. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something wrong with the posterior glenoid right there, right? Or actually, this is this posterior, this is anterior. So, so right in here. Okay. So we'll okay, so I so, did through there. So what's happening there? Uh, we're having some 
engaging of that uh, hill sax lead. Right. So that's called an engaging hill sax. Often produce clicking and pain. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're going to talk a, a lot more about this uh, in, in later, I think, in this lecture. Uh, so this is an engaging hill sax, and that's when the edge of the glenoid, you position the shoulder so the edge of the glenoid ends up falling into the hill sax defect. That often causes pain, uh, further traumatizes the joint space, and has clicking and uh, kind of not quite locking. But, uh, it can it, also have soft tissue, um, like capsular tissue and, and so on. Uh, that can cause clicking, and and that's a difficult to figure that out unless you have an MRI. Yeah. Okay, thirty-one year old male, shoulder with shoulder after this location. Um, so okay, if there's been a dislocation, I'm not sure if that defect in the posterior. Humeral head is a hill sax if we're too low, but uh, that's important. Uh, the, there are a lot of places where you can get hill sax lesions. The classic one is posterior superior, but it really depends upon the direction that the shoulder dislocates. And the shoulder can actually dislocate essentially 180 degrees around, but the vast majority are anterior and inferior. So the vast majority of impaction injuries are posterior superior. Here we're posterior, but we're inferior. This is a normal contour of the humeral head and is frequently misinterpreted as a hill sax. But this is normal anatomy here. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's, whoops, shoot. So maybe there's a little bit of separation here. Remember, we're near the equator here, maybe a little below it. You shouldn't really have any fluid going out uh, deep to the labrum at the equator or below. But we're kind of marginal here, but I'd be worried about that. Okay. So let's look at uh, other images. Okay, so image on the left, we're a little more superior. Yeah. So, and there is a hill sax defect. Yeah, so it's kind of V-shaped, kind of classic hill sax, a little bit of edema. And it, so this is relatively acute or subacute mm -hmm. uh, in this location. There's another image. Okay, so this is in a bare view. Yeah. And we see a tear of the anterior yeah. inferior. So this little thing here is now that little thing there. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a tear, but the periosteal attachments are still intact here. Mm -hmm. And that's where the A review can occasionally help. But as John said, a lot of people right after, uh, especially if it's their first time, dislocations are not going to let you put your shoulder in this position. But uh, I think can. So, uh, so one of the things to look at when you have shoulder instability, soft tissues are important and bones are important. Kind of a checklist to look for and shoulder impingement in terms of the bones, you need to look at the glenoid. You need to look at the version, whether it's retroverted or not. Uh, and remember that the, the non-retroverted shoulders, where you have antiversions, are at more risk for anterior instability, uh, whereas the retroverted shoulders are more at risk for posterior instability. Now you look for deficiencies and fractures, and we'll talk a lot in a minute about uh, bony uh, bank cart lesions, which are fractures to the anterior inferior uh, glenoid here, and how we uh, evaluate for uh, uh, numerically to help the surgeon decide what kind of surgery to perform. You also need to look to make sure you don't have uh, humeral, other humeral fractures and locations, and then chondral injuries, and obviously uh, uh, labral injuries would be under the soft tissues. And then there's the glenoid labrum here, uh, look for. Uh, and it should be firmly attached inferiorly, but not necessarily superiorly, which we've already talked about. Okay, go on. So we're looking at an axial image and
looks like there's an anterior probable labral tear and probably mm -hmm. posterior, yeah, right there, and then posteriorly as well, maybe. So we're going further up here. Okay. Um, so that might just be that uh, the superior recess with some fluid in it. We're getting up higher here now. And we'll see some irregularity. And now we're getting up to that anterior superior portion where there can be a lot of variation, but we still see that there's increased signal intensity and some blunting of that anterior labrum. And then we're now up pretty high. Okay. So, yeah, I would say there's a labral tear. So, okay. So you're going to diagnose labral tear. Okay. That's good. So now let's look a couple of months later. What we have, we have. This is now an arthrogram a couple of months later. What do you see here? It's the same level as this. Maybe a little irregularity there. Yeah. I would say that there's, it looks like it's kind of healed in the interim. So we don't really see much of a labral tear here. We do see a loose body back here. Okay. The labrum actually looks a lot better on the heart right. study. And then we're getting farther more superiorly to this level. And then up here, a little middle of the hemorrhage ligament and superior ligament. So, so if we go back here, that's a tear. Arthrography, actually, this was one I think I see a little bit better at uh, on the initial study. This is probably some contrast going deep to a little paralabral cyst here. Okay. Uh, and here we can see some fluid going there. Uh, but you have to be concerned, we're, we're low enough here where I don't think this is a sublabral foramen yet. We're a little too low for that. So this was an anterior labral tear. Okay. Robert. Uh, that, that that well, I I know we're not talking about the biceps, but that looks a little perched on on one view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? All right. So it looks like there's edema in that posterior lateral humeral head with probably a small impaction injury. Uh, anteriorly. I'm uh, trying to figure out what that is exactly, is that? Okay, so here we see this funny thing anteriorly here. Let's go more inferiorly anteriorly, and it looks like this. Uh, it almost looks like, looks like the anterior labrum is torn. Yeah, so yeah. now we're down inferiorly. This is the anterior inferior labrum. We're down yeah. close to the diaphysis of the humerus. And we can see that there's thickening, which we'll talk about in a little bit in a, later t uh, today, thickening of that uh, labral periosteal attachment here. It probably means it's right. a few, at least a few weeks old. And this is uh, a relatively acute Hill Sachs injury with uh, a, uh, a soft tissue bank card or an anterior inferior labral tear. Is this a post-op, John? No, not yet. Uh, what's that? Over here? Yeah. I think, I don't know, that's that's down near the diaphysis, probably a little bone island there, probably. I'd have to look at the other images to see. Okay. okay. So we have uh, an acute or subacute appearing uh, hill sex. And down pretty low now, and I don't see uh, an anterior inferior labrum. So what's this thing? I guess it's uh, is that inferior going here? Yeah. No, it's a torn labrum. Yeah. So this is a torn labrum, it's kind of degenerated and a little bit macerated. Okay. That's a displaced labrum. In that okay. location. Uh, so uh, we're talking about, so this is a patient who, if it's a young athlete, you know, you're going to go in and try to repair this. 
and uh, we'll talk about other things you need to do uh, to get stability back uh, besides repairing the labrum. Okay. Okay, so an acute hill sacs. We see edema in the uh, superior posterior labrum. Well, let's go back here. So this is on 2205, uh -huh. and this is now two months later. Um, there's reduced edema within the humeral head. There's, there's still cortical defect. Yeah, and again, it's that kind of V-shaped sort of thing. But that's what it looks like in the acute stage with acute edema. Mm -hmm. And within weeks later, it looks like this. So that, that edema can resolve fairly rapidly in these patients. And then we can see a little bit of blunting of that anterior labrum with increased signal intensity, but we don't see a discrete displaced tear. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Come on. Okay. Um, so 68-year-old male shoulder pain, weakness, decreased range of motion. So there's a hill sex defect with edema, so probably acute. And then let's see... Maybe a little bit of edema, like the medial aspect of the humeral head. And then at the superior aspect of the labrum, it looks like there's a maybe. This? Yeah, I can't tell what if the... that. I'm not entirely sure. It's right on the T2. Oh, um, so it could be. A cyst. This is a T1. I'm sorry. Uh, um, it's right on T1. Okay, and then what's happening down here? Oh, there's some edema there as well. Um, so that might be the, uh, the bank heart. Okay, now this, if you notice, is not the usual location for a, for a bank or a hill sacs. This is straight lateral. And this is not the usual location for a bony bank cart. This is straight inferior. So what this actually is, is an inferior dislocation rather than an anterior dislocation. <clears throat> but this is an acute impaction fracture. This happens to be interarticular fat that comes from the medullary bone space after the fracture. So it's bright on T1, and you can see it's dark on the fat suppressed images. And here's an inferior bony bank heart injury with a tear of the inferior labrum. Okay. That's actually a fracture of the gl glenoid. Yes, right here is a fracture of the glenoid. Right. Um, a bony bank heart fracture of the inferior glenoid. And then here, this is that fat within the joint space kind of floating around there the acute hill sacs impaction injury. And uh, here we can see part of the anterior labrum and glenoid is also involved here. Oh, this, so it's a little bit more posterior than I thought before. So this is an anterior inferior dislocation. But you can see the V-shaped uh, hill sacs acute impaction fracture, fracture of the bone here anteriorly and inferior, but it's still more of a superior fracture than before. And this patient has uh, interarticular fat within it. Pretty, pretty uncommon. But uh, if you see that, that, that's what you're dealing with. Robert. All right, so we have a 24-year-old with anterior dislocation. Um, the images on the right looks like there's a hill sacs impaction fracture with some edema. And on the left, it looks like there's, was that a fracture of the anterior glenoid? Or is it a yeah, the, the cortex may be involved here. I'd be very concerned about that. This is probably also a, uh, a tear of the labrum, anterior mm -hmm. inferior labrum there. And then there we can see the bony bank heart. So uh, what do you think the uh, A review is going to show in this arthrogram? Uh, I mean, I suspect it would be a tear of the anterior inferior labrum. And you can see here's a tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament over here which occurred in the dislocation, and that's the Abra view. And this actually is showing a bony bank heart fracture uh, that goes through the uh, articular cartilage and the labrum 
with displacement here. So in situations like this, it's a good idea, especially if it's a young athlete, to get a CT scan, because one of the things that we're going to talk about, I think later in this lecture, is the percentage of the glenoid which is involved with the fracture. And sometimes it's really hard to see how much bone is displaced on an MR examination because it's black and looks like the articular, like the labrum, which is black. And young athletes, they're, all, they're both black. So the CT can actually be important sometimes. So don't be afraid to request a CT scan uh, to do some of the measurements we're going to talk about later. So this is a bank cart. Uh, and again, we can see it on the, on the Abe review. I don't know how this patient could tolerate this. I know. I agree, but you see the patient's an athlete, has very well-developed muscular. Ouch. Yeah. Let's see, who's next? Megan. Okay. All right, looks like there is a hill sax lesion, not much edema, so yeah, three months after the injury, reasonable. Okay. And then there is some bony injury in the anterior inferior glenoid along with a labral tear. Okay, good. So there's the hill sacs and there. Now, if we go to the T1 weighted image at this level, you can actually see that there is, there is a fracture of that anterior glenoid. But again, it's really hard to see the fragment. And as you know, in a minute, we're going to have to estimate the um, percentage or the percentage of of the bone that's involved in the, in the fracture here to determine what to do with the patient. Okay. And then here we can see this is a, a loose body in the joint space. And so this was a bony band card. In a case like this, uh, uh, I think it's important to get the CT scan uh, as we'll talk about. So here we can see a plain film. There's some irregularity of the anterior glenoid here, but it's a little bit hard to really determine its significance. This is an old low field scanner. We can see a hill sacs impaction injury here. And here we can see a bony bank heart with disruption of the cortical bone, the subchondral bone and the cortical bone uh, down in the anterior inferior area and displaced uh, injury to the, to the labrum as well. Didn't the x-ray show a fracture, John? So what's that, John? Didn't the x-ray show a fracture? Yes. Uh, it's, but I, I think it's very hard. You can see a little interruption right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Okay. Kind of an unusual location. Okay, so here we see uh, edema and a fracture of the anterior glenoid. Right. Um, uh, more superiorly on the right, uh, there's some edema in the posterior humeral head. So there we go. But not, not a cortical but, defect. I so guess. in this particular case, we can actually see the fracture pretty well. So in this case, we can measure this fragment and that uh, and the, the, the base of the labrum here. And uh, then so we can add these two together to get the total cross uh, diameter of the glenoid, which would be about uh, 37 and a half. And then we can divide that into 14.5, multiply by 100 and get the percent involvement of the glenoid uh, by the fracture. Now, classically, in most of the texts, you measure this way because people in the early days when they made these measurements was in the early days of CT, and in those days you couldn't do reconstructions, so you had to measure everything in the plane of the acquisition. Uh, I think it's much more accurate to measure perpendicular to the fracture. So most people, even though there's not really great papers to, uh, to prove that it's better, uh, most people will uh, make these measurements perpendicular to the fracture. It's much more reproducible to do that. Those minor changes in position here can make very big differences in what these numbers are. 
if you're perpendicular to the fracture, you can move up and down, and you don't get anywhere near the variation in the measurements that you make. So I always, uh, and it's a technique called the perfect circle technique. You put in a circle, uh, which would go from here all the way around to the posterior glenoid and come around here. Then you'd measure the diameter of that circle. That should be the diameter of the intact uh, glenoid. And then you can measure the distance from the fracture line to the anterior circle, uh, which gives you the amount of unstable bone that's been fractured off. And then you can make the measurements. So that's the way most people who I know make these measurements now. Is this completely reduced, John? No. No. I don't been, think so. Yeah. So is, this, that a, is that a cent, central um, com, compression fracture of the glenoid? Well, this, this is the fracture uh, going no, on, the the, on the left glenoid. image. Yeah. Where, where you have the so so yeah, yeah this right is there the, in the center. Yeah, this is that bony bankart fragment. That's the anterior inferior rim of the glenoid, which is fractured right across here. So, I, 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 if, if it was me, I just call it a central glenoid fracture. Yeah, right, but. But nowadays, what they they w want to know is the percentage involvement here, which is, uh, and in the early literature, uh, if it's greater than 25% involvement, then it uh, indicates that you have to do a bony procedure to augment uh, for stability. Now, uh, that's changed, uh, where typically in non-athletic people, uh, it would be around 20%. And an athlete, some people use either 5 or 10%. So very small bony fragments and high-level athletes can be very significant. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, I think it's age-dependent age is what you're trying to say. Okay. So uh, I typically will put in a circle here with this software. I could, if you put it in the circle, it all messes everything up. Uh, we can measure the fragment, uh, the, the intact bone, and uh, add them together and, and come up, which is what I did here. Uh, this was 31.5, 14.5, and uh, come up with a percent involvement. And this, in this particular case, it was about 40, 46%, which was uh, very unstable. Now, and here's another example of a large uh, acute bony bankart lesion with some displacement. Uh, again, if you make these measurements, this is close to about a 40% involvement of the anterior glenoid. Now, and here there's the D, there's little d, and some of the papers, you add those up to get the, the full diameter, and then you do the little d divided by the full diameter times 100 gives you the percent involvement. Uh, so th this is kind of the way... Uh, well, it says glenoid fracture, right? What? Uh, it says glenoid fracture, Yes. not a bankart. Well, a bankart fracture is a fracture of the glenoid. Yeah, I know, but it's uh, um, uh, not, not to this extent. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, at least that's the way I learned it, John. Okay, yeah. Now it's it's just the fracture. These are typically called bony bankart fractures if it's in the setting of a dislocation. Here you can see the hill sacs lesion, uh, and yeah. But but again, most people will go ahead and put in a circle here, and uh, to take the diameter of the circle as the diameter of the glenoid. Then you you do a, a transverse. A measurement of the fracture component and then do the, the, the percentage. Now, so this is one thing you need to know, and you need to give the, the surgeon the percent involvement of the, the glenoid fracture. The other thing that you need to know about is the glenoid track. Now, the glenoid track, uh, basically, there are a number of papers that have looked into this. You, know, you basically... Uh, can move the shoulder basically along the throwing mechanism and look to see 
uh, where in the shoulder the articular cartilage of the humeral head and the glenoid contact each other throughout the entire throwing mechanism. That is called, and the, the area where this contacts the humeral head uh, is called the glenoid tract. It's a tract uh, the glenoid makes on the humeral head during the throwing mechanism. Uh, Robert, what kind of a imaging technique is that? That last one. We're talking about this one here? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. It looks like a CT. Uh, that's the Aber view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Am I right, John? Yeah, right. And this is actually a single coil used to acquire it. Uh, this is from this particular paper. Um, most of these studies have been done either with CT or in the cadaver lab. I think the initial studies were done more in cadaver labs. And here, this just shows you in the different positionings of the humeral head. This is way up high and then down lower. Uh, this is where you get contact on, this is where the glenoid would be. And here, as you can see, the contact on the humeral head goes right along the humeral head in this location. And this is basically the glenoid track as you go through the throwing mechanism where the two articular cartilage contact each other. Here's just basically another example showing where that glenoid tract is. And therefore, if the hill sachs lesion overlaps with the glenoid tract, then they're going to engage and you can get pain and injury to the shoulder. And that's the, the concept of the importance here. So the old days, again, this is a big D and little d, uh, that you would do it in the axial plane. Now, again, I, I think everyone I know uh, does it perpendicular to the fracture, and I think that's the easiest way to do. So you, you put in a, a circle that fits the glenoid, which should be circular. You measure that diameter. Then you measure the perpendicular distance here, uh, and then you can calculate the percent involvement of the bone. Now, the other thing that you use these numbers for is for calculating the glenoid tract. And it turns out that in measurements done by CT, if you take these numbers, uh, the actual width of the glenoid tract is less than the overall glenoid because you don't contact the entire glenoid throughout the, the throwing mechanism. Uh, well, the width of that glenoid tract turns out to be big D times 0.83 minus little d. And so that's the measurement of the glenoid tract. <clears throat> so you have to make these measurements in order to calculate the glenoid tract. Uh, and then the next measurement you, you need to make is the width of the hill sacs lesion itself. And uh, in this particular case, in the early days with CT, people would do measurements, they'd measure the bony uh, uh, impaction, and they found there was a little piece of intact cortical bone usually between the edge of the hill sacs lesion and the insertion of the rotator cuff back here, primarily the infraspinatus tendon. Uh, so the hill sacs interval is de de uh, defined as the width of the bony injury uh, plus uh, this little uh, 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 distance between the where the bone was still intact up to the uh, edge of the of the uh, uh, of the rotator cuff insertion. Usually, I just make one measurement from the medial aspect of the hill sacs impaction edge of the hill sacs impaction injury up to where you see the cuff uh, insert in, into the bone. And that's called the hill sacs interval. So, and then uh, you then can determine whether the the lesion is on track or off track. And this can be a little confusing if you're not a surgeon. On track means that the hill sacs injury uh, always stays. Uh, in the area of the contact between the humeral head and the glenoid. And therefore, 
the edges of the glenoid never fall into the lesion itself. So that lesion is on track, that means it does not engage, and that's good. So you want an on-track lesion. <clears throat> an off-track lesion is where the size of the hill sax lesion is larger than the glenoid tract, and therefore it will, during the me mechanism, it will, it will uh, shift off the, the glenoid, and the edge of the glenoid will extend into the hill sax lesion, producing pain and injury. So if the hill sac interval is less than the glenoid tract, then the hill sac lesion is on track, and that's good. Yeah. Well, you can see that on, at the time of surgery, uh, whether it's going to engage or not. Um, although the patient is anesthetized and, and the muscles are relaxed, probably um, because they get connecting, but um, I think also you could probably use an anesthetic, a local anesthetic, and see if it's going to engage. But that's um, that's a, a little uh, scary to do because what if it doesn't go back in place? Uh, so, yeah. and then in other words, you can dislocate the shoulder and relocate it. That's kind of scary. Okay. Uh, but it's doable. Yeah. You can do these measurements at arthroscopy as well, but most of the arthroscopists I've talked to aren't comfortable with the accuracy of those measurements done. Uh, so they want them done before surgery. Yeah, I, I, I would like those measurements. But, but the thing is, at surgery, John, you lo dislocate and relocate uh, as often as you want uh, because there's no traction. I mean, that the muscles are not responding because of uh, being paralyzed. So uh, you cannot really hurt the patient by relocating or dislocating the shoulder. Okay. You can actually put the shoulder right into the, into the uh, fracture site. Right. So in some of the early papers, then it's what they... Uh, in order to, to make a decision as to what kind of surgery to do, uh, <clears throat> you would determine first if it's an on-track or off-track lesion by whether the hill sacs interval was less than or greater than uh, the, uh, the glenoid tract. And then you'd, uh, you'd measure the percent of bony bank heart if they have a bony bank heart fracture. And then if it's an on-track lesion, if the uh, percent involvement of the uh, fracture was less than 25%, they would just do a, a bank cart repair. Uh, if, uh, if it's an off-track lesion, which means it engaged and it's less than 25%, they'd do a repair plus a remplissage. And I'll show you what a remplissage is in uh, a little bit. Uh, that, that then limits the motion of the shoulder so that they can't actually engage, get into the position where they can engage. If the, uh, uh, you have a large glenoid fracture, so it's greater than 25%, and it's on track, <clears throat> you would do a glenoid augmentation, and we'll talk about what, what uh, surgeries you can do for doing that in a minute. <clears throat> and if it's a large uh, fracture, if it's off track, you do both a, a bony augmentation plus humeral head, and we'll, we'll talk about and see some of these surgeries in a minute. So if we go through some of this, this is another paper in, in arthroscopy. There you can see the measurements they made. This is just a diagram of what's happening here. It's basically the normal shoulder. Uh, there's the, uh, uh, the uh, glenoid tract on the humeral head in blue. <clears throat> uh, and then here's a situation where you have a bony bank cart lesion, but the uh, the uh, track is actually uh, the the glenoid is on track in this area where the hill sac interval is smaller than the glenoid tract and therefore uh, uh, the entire defect stays within the uh, uh, the the glenoid here 
the margin of the glenoids do not fall into the lesion, and therefore this is an on-track lesion. Uh, here's one where you have an off-track lesion. Uh, well, I guess they don't show there, but uh, where you know, actually the, the glenoid will extend into that defect. So another way to look at it, the glenoid tract is about 83% uh, of the normal glenoid if you do not have a bony band cart. This would be an on-track lesion where the hill sacs lesion stays within the glenoid tract and never falls off the edge. Here's one where it falls off the edge and engages and produces pain. So that's, those are on-track, off-track lesions. This just shows examples of trying to make these measurements at the time of arthroscopy. Here you can see the, the bank cart uh, impaction fracture there. And here they're trying to measure uh, the bony bank cart area and the, and the uh, hill sacs interval. And here again, here's a hill sacs injury uh, where they're trying to make, make those measurements. And here we can see a lot of cartilage disease. So uh, and then they just made the their repairs. So we've already talked about this. We've already talked about this too. Now, now generally for athletes, instead of using twenty or twenty five percent, which you'd use in the general population, it's more around five to ten percent. And and professional athletes, especially if they do overhead activity. Uh, the generally people use around 5% now, which is a very thin sliver of bone. <clears throat> and making that measurement accurate, I think really often is very helpful to have a CT scan to, to do that particular measurement. And then again, uh, uh, if it's group one, you just do an arthroscopic band part repair. Uh, group two, which is small defect, but off track, oops. Small defect, but off track. Uh, you do an uh, arthroscopic bank cart repair, basically a labral repair, plus a remplissage. And then uh, you do bony techniques. One is a ladder J. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so let me show some examples, maybe later. So here, here we can see the measurement of heel sacs interval. And this patient who had an acute heel sacs injury, it's a 1.9 centimeters. Uh, here we can see... Uh, in this particular patient, there's a bony band cart injury right here. And if you do a, uh, uh, here's a circle, uh, kind of the perfect circle technique where you fit the circle to the glenoid, and then you can measure the diameter of the circle, uh, which is 3.6 centimeters. And then here you can measure the uh, width of the, uh, of the band cart fracture, which is uh, 0 0.2, so 3.6. Uh, if we take this measure of the glenoid tract is 2.8 centimeters, the hill sacs interval was 1.9, therefore the, the glenoid tract is greater than the hill sacs interval, so this is an on-track, non-engaging lesion. And then if you do the, this was a 5% lesion, so this would be borderline in, a, in, a, uh, in an athlete, uh, in a non-athlete uh, you wouldn't worry about doing a bony repair. Okay, I think, okay, here's an NFL player 24 hours after shoulder pain after an injury. Perfect circle kind of technique. It's 3.2 centimeters. See a little bit of a bony band cart fragment right down there. And there on the 3D, you can see that little bony band cart down here. Uh, uh, this was a this was that same patient. This was a 5% lesion. And you can see that bone better on the CT scan. So certainly if it's a professional athlete, I would get a CT scan. Uh, they elected to not do the bony procedure, uh, nor a remplissage, but they just did an arthroscopic labor repair. Okay, this is a patient who had previous six recent dislocations after they had surgery five years ago. Here you can see a marked deformity of the glenoid. Uh, and you can see there was a large uh, uh, bank cart fracture here, and you can see evidence of prior labral repair, arthroscopic labral repair there. Here, if we look at the hill sac interval, it's 2.7 centimeters. We do the perfect circle technique. Uh, we can see that there's a large area of devoid of bone here anteriorly. Make the uh, measurements of the two. We, it ends up being a 28% defect in the glenoid. 
which is large even for uh, the general population. And in this case, they elected that a bony procedure would, need, would be needed for stability. And also, if you look at the, that the hill sacs interval is larger than the glenoid tract, and therefore this was an engaging lesion. So in this particular case, it's an off-track lesion. That's the uh, regular people. We already talked about this. This was one other paper that used 13.5, uh, but basically uh, we've talked about these. So uh, uh, now let's, we're, we're actually getting... Now, one thing that that uh, also needs to know, and so this was, so far I've been talking primarily about when young athletes, but a lot of these patients are also older individuals, uh, and if they have cartilage disease in the shoulder, degenerative disease in the shoulder, then uh, many surgeons do not recommend doing a ladder J or Bristo, because if you do a ladder J or Bristo, it makes it very difficult to do a shoulder replacement. So in that case, many surgeons recommend doing bone grafting, more, more of an anatomic uh, uh, technique, uh, which then, if you have to go on to a, to a uh, uh, shoulder replacement, it makes the shoulder replacement very easy. So I think maybe, why don't we stop here, and now we're going to... Uh, we're going to come back and talk about the bone surgical procedures that you can use to stabilize the shoulder, uh, which are the ladder J, which is typically done as an arthroscopic technique, or the Bristow, which is classically done as an open surgical technique uh, to produce stability. And so we'll start this topic on Thursday. Okay? All right. All right. Thank you. John, do you want to add anything? Um, well, I... The ladder jet and Bristol are uh, just uh, different procedures, but but uh, ladder jet is, is taken from the Bristol procedure, uh, right. right? And and it's no, it's just harder to do. Um, it, what what Campbell says about that is. Uh, uh, if you're going to do a ladder jet procedure and a Bristol procedure, um, you better have extra training. Okay. That's what Campbell says. Yeah. Well, we'll talk in detail about what the difference is between the two on Thursday. Okay, John, and you can help us with that. We will, and uh, uh, I'll be here. Okay, great. Thanks. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.